Hey there, and thanks for tuning in. I'm so excited to present Mr. Matt Chapel from a restaurant called Gather, a farm fresh eatery located in Yarmouth, Maine on the coast. Matt is a real operator who's been in business seven years now. He started off like I did in the dish pit so long ago as a teenager. He worked his way up. He found a real passion for this business in cooking, and now he's the general manager of his own restaurant. We talk about the importance of space or ambiance. We talk about leadership skills style and how, what it's like to manage the front and the back of the house. We talk about cost controls and profits and marketing and all the daily challenges of running restaurants. So you really got to stay tuned to this episode. There are so many key learnings that you're not going to want to miss. So listen up. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, engaging topics that help restaurants rock their profits, build their brands, and deliver amazing guest service experiences. We're trying something new today in this episode. I want to interview everyday restaurant operators that have interesting concepts. Today, I have Mr. Matt Chappell. He owns a restaurant called Gather in Yarmouth, Maine, just down the street from where I live. We've gotten to know each other, uh, working with the Maine Hospitality Association. And I just thought Matt had an interesting restaurant that I really want to talk about. I think there's some key learnings. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks for being with us. Good to be here. Excellent. So Matt, you've got a beautiful, beautiful building, and that's probably the first thing that stands out. It has more than what I call curb appeal, but it also has some history to it. Why don't you tell us about how you came to own this building, what first attracted you to it, and maybe some of the challenges of owning an old historic building? Well, I should correct you. I don't actually own the building. I am a tenant. Um, but uh, I, I came upon this space. Uh, it's right in the center of the town that I live in. And uh, probably about seven years ago, I was across the street with my two boys. We were skating and uh, I saw that there was a for lease sign that had come up for it. And I know it was admired the space. Uh, really, it, it's, uh, it's an old Masonic hall. So think of a Grange Hall, big, tall, uh, ceilings, uh, big windows, uh, very much an open uh, space that uh, really has a history of being uh, a, a place where people in town would gather. Now the Masonic or the Masons uh, would meet upstairs, but the downstairs portion was a public space. So everything happened there, uh, uh, including voting, uh, shows, uh, dances, uh, you name it. Uh, it. It was the center of town in, in a lot of different ways. So when it came up for lease, I thought, uh, well, we can do better than the antique shop that was in there at the time. And I was uh, had always wanted to uh, get up and running with a restaurant, and, and this space really inspired me. So it was exciting. Talk, right? Because of the history there? Say that again? If the walls could only talk, like all the things yes. that happened in that building... Do you know when it was built? 1862, I believe, is the okay. uh, history. And the Masons occupied it until the 1980s. And then since 1980, it's had lots of different tenants, some of them food-oriented, uh, others, like I said, an antique shop. I think there was a candy store, a cheese shop. Uh, so uh, it's had a lot of different lives. And it's a, it's a beautiful space. So in terms of build out, obviously I had to do uh, a full kitchen and we put that up on the stage, which was, uh, you know, really the perfect spot. It's about four feet above the, the dining room, looking out over, it's open to the public. People like that. They want to see their food being made for them. Uh, there's nothing to hide uh, and you can't hide behind it. So it's a, it's a very open concept. Uh, but in terms of the build out, uh, you know, the shell was so beautiful that it was really just a matter of, right, how are we going to do tables? Where's the bar going to go? That kind of thing. Now, that's very important because you had to determine, you know, flow of traffic and, and where to locate the bar and how many seats you could fit. Um, did you have requirements from the town of how many seats that you could have in the space? I did. In fact, uh, I had a, 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 we were subject to an old, uh, 1986 law that the town had put in place uh, that limited the number of seats in the village. And their reason for doing that was essentially to try and keep McDonald's out of town. I think McDonald's was knocking at the door and wanted to be in 
in the village and for whatever reason at, at that time the town didn't want it so they enacted a law that didn't explicitly exclude McDonald's but made it prohibitive for them to come in and we all lived with those laws until um, I, I really felt like the limitation was too much and especially for our space I think I could only have as many as uh, 60 seats and uh, even that was limited by parking down to 45 uh, so I approached the town uh, and through a process of many town council meetings we changed the law basically uh, and expanded the number of seats and really took a fresh look at how we think about parking in the village as well that was the other part of the conversation yeah and parking is very important obviously for guest convenience and whatnot and i knew you had some challenges with that up front uh with parking yes although you know people are they're they're really creative about how they <laughs> park it's it's never been an issue there's there's enough parking around town on the street uh in different lots that aren't used during dinner service for example uh uh, town hall, which is closed, or a library, or a school that might be closed. There's plenty of parking to be had. So parking was never the issue. It was the law that was prohibitive. Now, one thing that really strikes me about the building that Gather is in is the visibility that you have, both from Route 1, which is a busy two-lane, sort of, I wouldn't necessarily call it a highway, but at the point where it passes your building, it gets lots and lots of traffic. And your building just jumps out, and there's a sign on both sides that, obviously, it says, Gather, a farm fresh eatery. And I love that, you know, that is what you hold your hat on, and that's the tagline of the business. But then you're also on Main Street, which is historic Main Street in the village which also gets a ton of traffic so my first impression um you know when i first saw your building years ago was wow that looks like a very attractive restaurant even though i know nothing about it i'm attracted to the building i'm attracted to the signage a farm fresh eatery says it all but then you walk through the front door and your ambiance is just beautiful it's warm it's inviting it's you know the layout and the way you situated the bar in the open kitchen everything about the space really lends itself to the name gather it's a place where people get together right. to celebrate and to have special occasions and to share break bread you know enjoy a drink uh, a glass of wine and have a farm fresh meal i think that's a wonderful combination so i've always been a believer in food service and ambiance and i've, I've been right. to gather and i think you're hitting all three that's tremendous let me ask you matt how did you get into this business and how did you come to start a restaurant for the first time and how long ago was that well, uh, if I could just go back, I'll tell you that in a second. I, I, if I could go back to one of your points, uh, it might be relevant to people. Uh, one of the first things I did when I went into that space uh, was to address the acoustics. And I, I think this is something that gets overlooked when people do build outs. Uh, uh, oftentimes you'll go into a space that's been newly renovated, a lot of hard surfaces, both ceiling, um, walls, floor, and it's deafening and people can't hear each other. And as soon as you, you don't really realize it until you put 80 people into a space and all of a sudden the volume goes way up and I can't hear you talk even though you're three feet from me. And that's right. a huge turnoff for people who, especially older people, but it, it, it really doesn't matter even age. If, if I can't go to a restaurant and enjoy a conversation with, the person I'm, I'm with, uh, it's one of those things that you see written in reviews, oh, the place was really loud, and luckily that didn't happen to us, and it was a challenging space. So I worked with a, an acoustic group that helped me with how we were going to address the ceiling, which is essentially all you have to do. You don't have to worry about walls or anything like that. You address the ceiling, noise goes up, and if you can catch it going up, you're done. Uh, so I just wanted to say that was one of the early challenges was addressing acoustics right out of the gate, not after the fact, but during yes. your build up. Great point. Can you tell us what they did to the ceiling to minimize or alleviate some of that noise? Well, uh, essentially they have models uh, where you input the dimensions of your space and uh, they recommend uh, a certain percentage of acoustic tile that gets suspended from the ceiling. It's about eight inches uh, below the ceiling and noise travels up naturally. It's just the way it, it works. If you can trap it up there, then it doesn't come bouncing back down. 
Yeah, so. uh, is essentially how, how we dealt with it. But um, anyway, I thought that might be relevant to what you were talking about earlier, but I'll answer your question now, uh, which was how I got into the business, correct? Before we go there, I just had one more yeah. thought. Did you have any air issues, you know, with makeup air and your equipment uh, exhaling air out the building versus the air that would come in naturally through the airlocks and the doors in that large space? Were there any issues with that, with smoke and coming from the cooking equipment or anything entering the dining room? I had that problem. Um, yes, uh, there were some of those. Now, I have a makeup air system that goes with the hood system. And that's all calibrated based on uh, the amount of heat and smoke that kicks off more makeup air, the more you suck. Uh, but um, one of the challenges of that is in the winter, you're blowing cold air, not only on your staff on the line, but you're blowing cold air onto your cooking equipment that's trying to stay at a certain temp. So imagine uh, a, a range that's got a hot flame and cold air is blowing down on it. Uh, that's challenging every year, and we've come up with some ways to address it. Uh, obviously, one of them is to heat your makeup air, but I just feel like that's wasted energy. You're heating air that's going to get sucked right out. Uh, so uh, it, it seemed counterintuitive to me. But yes, we had to address how air was flowing both in the kitchen and in the space. And it, it, it works well. Uh, it, it works well. It took some tinkering, probably took about six to eight months for us to get it right. <laughs> These are some of the challenges of running restaurants. You get yes. space and, and you have to live and work within the confines and the constraints of that space. And sometimes right. you open a restaurant and you find these things out after you open. So I've had plenty right. of challenges there as well. Right, right, right. All right, tell us, Matt, how'd you get into the business and what made you want to start a restaurant? Sure. <laughs> what? Uh, well, uh, I got into it, I think, uh, like so many others, uh, at age 14, I picked up a dishwashing job down the street uh, from where I lived. And uh, I was already interested in food. I, uh, I just had spent a lot of time uh, cooking in the house, uh, enjoying the preparation of a meal, all those things. So it was a natural step to say, hey, what are you going to do? You're 14. What, what kind of job can you get in town? So I, I picked up a dishwashing job that led to a, a prep cook role. Uh, and uh, eventually I parlayed that into uh, a line cook gig. Uh, although interesting story that the line cook interview, uh, I had no experience, although I told him I did have experience. I, the only experience I had was dishwashing and prep cook, no line experience. And he said, well, show me how to cut an onion. He, he, he made me cut an onion uh, as, as a test. <laughs> I passed. <All> right. uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I was in the restaurant game from age 14 until about 29. Uh, and then I decided to get out and uh, worked in uh, – business for a while and then since uh, that period of about 12 years uh, never really let go I, I felt like uh, it was something I'd always wanted to do so when the space became available I decided to uh, make the leap and uh, open gather about seven years ago would you say that you from that very young age of 14 on after you cut that first onion that you developed a real passion for cooking or was it just something that you did that you enjoyed doing but you weren't really passionate i mean would you call it a passion i mean you still cook today and gather i i do i i, I like i like the uh the experience of being around food creating dishes um the camaraderie that comes in a kitchen of preparing uh, a menu together with other people. I, I enjoy that part quite a bit. So uh, it's uplifting every day, uh, even, even now. Uh, it's, that part's not a grind. Uh, when your equipment starts breaking or uh, all the other not so fun things, that, that can drag you down. But the kitchen part is, is still uplifting for me. And it's, and it's a natural high when things are humming on all cylinders, your restaurant's busy and you're just cranking out the food, right? And, and we refer to it sometimes as controlled chaos in the kitchen. But there's something gratifying about that, especially at the end of the shift when your team came together and then you really pulled forward oh, yes. and just enjoyed the food, right? 
Yes, very much so. Everyone wants to know how many did we do, and uh, yeah. Yeah. and there, you know, even if there are bumps along the way uh, where you get buried in tickets, then uh, you emerge from that, and and everyone is excited to be finished and proud of the work that they do. Uh, and yeah, there's there's an adrenaline there that happens that is hard to ignore. So you mentioned you're into this seven years now. Correct. Uh, yes, we're in our seventh year. Okay. Let's talk about staffing because this whole country, especially in the restaurant business, is challenged with uh, what we call the labor shortage and low unemployment and the difficulties in finding and keeping a good staff. Um, are you having that challenge as well? Um, I have had that challenge, uh, particularly over the last two years, but in the last four months, uh, things have improved. But I don't know that the market has changed. I think it's more the way I've approached uh, uh, taking care of the people that I have uh, and making sure that uh, they want to be here and stick around and aren't looking for what is the next great gig coming along. Uh, so that comes uh, in choosing the right people to begin with. Uh, but also doing the hard work of recognizing their good work, rewarding them with pay, uh, and uh, also giving them opportunity to be creative. That's, I think, one of the things that's underestimated in this world. We, we are in this uh, uh, trade of, of running a restaurant. I think the, the creative part can be limited to too many people. Now, obviously, there's a danger if you spread it around too much. But one of the things I do is, I engage quite a few people in the process of menu development and specials uh, and really give them an opportunity to put a stamp on something, to be creative, to have an idea that then goes out to the public in the form of a dish. And we get instant feedback, don't we? They either like it or they don't like it. Correct. There's, I like, you know, that's a good thing. Um, you know, especially when your customers let you know that they appreciate what you've done and the creativity is recognized. And then that leads to obviously online reviews and social media posts and all these things. And that is such a powerful form of marketing today. And we'll get to marketing in a moment, but I think we're touching yes. on leadership style because you divide your time between the back of the house and the front of the house. And you're very yes. much a part of your restaurant. You're the spirit of your restaurant. People clearly respect you. But I'd love to know how you would describe your management style and how you get the best out of your people, both in the back of the house and the front of the house. Right. Well, uh, yes, let me clarify. I am not a chef owner scenario. I have a chef that runs the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a front of the house manager that runs the front. So I'm much more the general manager. I still work in both sides uh, and roll up my sleeves. So that's one element of my management style is that none of this stuff is above me. If we're down a dishwasher, I'm on the dish pit. Uh, I'm prepping in the kitchen two days a week. Uh, I'm hosting on the floor. Uh, I'm running glassware, whatever it is. So that, that part uh, uh, engenders some good spirit from your mm -hmm. employees if you're willing to uh, do the work alongside them. Um, Lead by example. Not to, not to be underestimated. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, but I would consider myself probably more of a cheerleader than anything else. Um, I'm, I never wanted to create an environment that was hostile or authoritarian. Um, I worked in those places where there was a lot of hotheads that would bark at people and uh, very selective about the people that I brought into the restaurant, both in the kitchen and the front, uh, in terms of their... Uh, their demeanor, especially their demeanor when things get intense, because that's naturally where things are going to come out. Uh, so how do they behave when things start to get chaotic? And uh, I don't keep people that are hotheads for very long, if they even make it on to the team. So uh, I think, uh, you know, in terms of management style, cheerleading, um, giving people opportunity to be creative and working alongside them. Okay. Do you find a big difference in the people, the division of labor between front and back of house? In some restaurants, it could be a challenge because obviously, you know, you have 
employees that receive gratuities in the front of the house and the people in the back of the house often are paid less per hour. Uh, they're working under more challenging conditions, you know, blazing stoves and all this kind of stuff for many, many hours at a time. And it takes a certain kind of person to do both jobs, but to bring the team together to have this cohesive unit is one of the biggest challenges in any restaurant. And do you find that to be a challenge or have you found a way to, you know, to address that and bring the team together? Yes. Um, so we can't ignore the fact that there's inequity. Uh, it, it is the nature of it. You've got front of the house that's working shorter hours and making more money. People in the back that are working longer hours and still making decent money, but for, for longer hours. So there's, there is an equity there that I, I wish we could figure out as an industry to balance a little bit better. I, I've scratched my head on that one a number of times. I know people have talked about going to no tipping. Some have tried it. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging one. So recognizing that that exists is perhaps one of the biggest things. But uh, I, I really go out of my way to make sure that uh, we don't get into the blame game front and back, uh, pointing fingers. Uh, so too often, if there is a problem, it's easy for the front to say, well, the back screwed up or vice versa, and just really work hard to make sure that that uh, kind of uh, path we don't go down. And that means having uh, frequent meetings to uh, hash out some of the things. What, what are we doing about when something gets 86 to, or what are we doing about, uh, you know, how tickets get fired, so on and so forth. All those little things that can cause little issues. Uh, and uh, so putting people together at a table and hearing them out, coming up with a solution and moving on, that, that tends to be the way that we handle it. Uh, I, I definitely make it really clear that I'm not interested in pointing fingers one way or the other. If something isn't quite right at a table, is there a certain right or wrong way in your establishment to approach the kitchen? Is it the server's responsibility to go back to the line and say, hey, I need this, uh, you know, cooked a little bit more or I need this replaced or it's like, how does that work together? I would say that it ha the degree of the issue is probably dictating what, what happens. Uh, so for example, if it's, yeah. A minor issue at the table with a, a temp on a meat that's not done right, sure, the server is going to address that, bring it back to the kitchen, make it right. Uh, if uh, the problem is more pronounced or uh, an escalated one, then uh, the manager is really more responsible for stepping into the situation to diffuse it. Uh, the thing that's really challenging is I, I feel like these days in, with social media and, and uh, review sites, people choose to not say anything in Correct. the restaurant environment and then really lash out at you after the fact. So uh, I find myself these days, if there is a bad situation that comes out online, is to apologize, but also to say, you know, I wish you had come to us while you were in the restaurant and giving us a chance to make it right. Of course. <laughs> These are simple yeah. things that we could fix if we knew about them, but people don't want to say anything. They want to, they want to lash out later uh, on social media. It's really frustrating. So it is absolutely uh, training people to, to look for those cues, you know, does someone look unhappy? Are they looking around? Are they, uh, un are they not touching their meal? So encouraging servers to ask, is everything okay? Is there anything we can do to make it better? That's one line of defense. I've seen restaurants go as far as to print something on the menu that says, we want you to be completely satisfied. If anything isn't perfect, please bring it to our attention immediately. We want to make it right. You know, that sort of thing. It's just one more thing you can do. Because I agree with you. After the fact, it can be so damaging on social media and it can be something really minor that isn't your fault. And I agree with you, you should respond to every online post, or as many as you can, but certainly, you know, put a positive spin and do something right for the customer when it is a complaint. But yeah, that is one of the challenges for sure. Can we talk about any special training that, that you personally get involved in with your staff and either front and back of the house? I mean, how do you bring people 
up to speed and, and onboard them at Gather if, if it's somebody new, whether they have experience or they don't have experience? And what's that whole process like, including the training? Well, um, I would say I, I, I'd say that part is not as formalized as it probably could be. But uh, what I find uh, happens naturally and the way we've set it up is there's usually at least two or three shifts where someone's in a training mode and they're paired up with somebody during that uh, during those three uh, days of training. And it's preferably someone different each time. That way they're getting different perspectives on how to handle uh, a certain front of the house or back of the house. Uh, so we don't throw someone right into the mix from the day one. We, we do our best to give them training hours. Uh, so it's a lot of shadowing and a progression. So the first day they're really observing. The second day they're doing a little bit. The third time they're actually doing the work, but being watched or observed by uh, the person who is training them. So they progress through those three days. Uh, and that happens both in the front and the back. And then once they've been around for a while, they're involved in, in you know, regular meetings and that sort of thing, and, and they're encouraged to participate and to provide input on anything that might improve the experience at Gather, and we encourage that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, we're next week having a, a, a fairly regular front of the house meeting, um, and that agenda changes, but primarily it's, all right, we've got a new line uh, lineup coming up. Coming up. What, what do we need to know about those wines? We have a new menu, so we're talking about that. But then we're getting into, um, for example, this time around, we're, we're talking about your table service uh, skills. So what's happening at the table, the degree to which uh, they're getting into detail about specials, suggesting things. So uh, there's some uh, coaching that's going on, uh, but it's also an opportunity for them to uh, express what might not be working for them. Uh, so uh, things that they see on a regular basis that we might not see because they're the ones that are interacting with the customer. So uh, what maybe it's something to do with a current dish on the menu or uh, could be anything, but opening that door saying, what, what are you hearing? What, uh, what feedback do you have about your experience? That's a regular practice. How often does your menu change? We change about five times a year, and they're usually based on the seasons of what is available from a food standpoint. Uh, and those changes are sometimes not huge. I mean, there might be a 20% change in the menu. This next one is... 50 to 60% as we go into spring. So a much more significant change. And a, a big one that we're adding uh, is uh, an oyster program, raw oyster, which uh, we've never done before. And it requires more than just adding a dish on the menu, of course, because you're talking about how are we gonna serve it? How are we gonna shuck it? Um, where are we gonna store it? Uh, all of those things. So we're trying to add some new things that keep people interested and uh, hopefully the oyster thing will work out. <laughs> I think that makes perfect sense in a coastal town like Yarmouth, Maine. <laughs> yes, I know. As someone said that to me. They, say, they said, I'm surprised you haven't done this yet already. So we're on it. What are, the, what are some of the staples that never change the most popular dishes on your menu at Gather? Well, uh, yes, uh, I would say there's probably three that I, I know of that have been on the menu since we started. One's a maple creme brulee, uh, just has a really unique and fun uh, flavor. It's also a main maple syrup. The other one is a soy lime Brussels sprouts that's uh, uh, been on the menu since we started. Really simple dish, easy pickup, but just super flavorful, really intense. So it's soy, lime, fish sauce, uh, but the Brussels sprouts are deep fried, which most people don't know. We don't advertise that, but there is something about that process that makes them taste even better. And, uh, crispy. and then the crispy. third, yeah, crispy, um, not mushy at all. Yeah. Um, 
it kind of the frying kind of opens up the Brussels sprouts a little bit, so the flavors really get in there. And so that one's been a big hit. Um, and then of course our uh, our burger, which we work with a lot of small farms. We uh, right here in Maine, and we grind our own meat every day. So literally are uh, getting trim and grinding that meat uh, and forming the burgers each day. So nothing gets old, very fresh tasting, uh, simple, uh, and it's worked out really well. I, I think those those signature items, the ones that we get known for, are really important to have. You know, that's the, the image that people have, especially the regulars, that oh, I want to come back and get the Brussels sprouts at Gather or whatever it is. And that's also where the farm fresh eatery comes in. You've built relationships with some local farms that provide you with much of your product. Yes, uh, uh, which is not a new idea uh, at all. Uh, in fact, um, so many places do it. What I heard a lot when I was opening up, um, restaurants would say, well, we use local food when we can, uh, which seemed kind of weak to me, uh, not much of a commitment. Uh, so I felt like we had to make a commitment and two thirds of our dollars go to food from uh, the region. So that's everything from pork and beef to vegetables, dairy, fish. Uh, luckily, we have a lot of great food to be had even in the winter time. You'd be surprised. Uh, Farmers are getting very good at storing vegetables now. Um, not that they weren't before, but they know that restaurants want vegetables year round. There are a lot of uh, uh, growers that have found ways to, to grow year round in hoop houses or heated hoop houses and so on and so forth. So that's our commitment. Um, we need to do a better job of telling that story and we're working on that right now. Uh, I'm not sure we've done a great job of communicating uh, uh, who those partners are, those suppliers, and uh, that's something we're working on. Well, I think you're fortunate in that, um, just to give our audience a geographical lesson. So we're located, and Gather is located about 10 miles north of Portland, Maine, which is uh, a beautiful coastal city, but it's also surrounded by numerous communities that are essentially farmland. So the towns of Cumberland and North Yarmouth and Topsom and all these areas have plenty of farms that produce, you know, a lot of these fresh local ingredients, and that's, and that's what you're offering. So it's a beautiful thing to have these resources close by and to take a stand for, you know, farm fresh eating, even though it's not a right. new concept, it's, it's a commitment and you've made that commitment. And, and I'll, I'll just say um, on, on that front, uh, I think one of our uh, uh, biggest uh, successes has been a way to uh, deliver uh, local food at a reasonable price while still achieving uh, really good food costs. So uh, we've avoided the, the high ticket items, the, the ribeyes and the lamb chops and uh, the really expensive fishes uh, and found uh, some really good tasting items that are affordably priced, locally sourced, and it lets us uh, deliver a, a menu to people that isn't that fine dining, you know, $35, $40 entree, but more $22 or uh, even less than that. So, for example, uh, hake is a fish that is uh, from the area and a really nice white fish that's sort of underutilized. We've had a lot of success with that. But then on the meat side of things, we do a lot of braising. So that's not something people do at home a lot, but short rib is a great example of a very affordable meat, tastes good. Uh, and you can deliver it as a, at a reasonable price. One of my favorites, I would call that, you know, comfort food for sure, you know? Yeah. Comfort food. Now, it's really interesting economy and a dynamic because Portland, Maine is one of the most recognized restaurant towns in America. Per capita, there's an incredible amount of restaurants in Portland that have those 30, 40, 50 and higher entrees all over town. And now you're just outside of town, but you've got a more approachable menu, despite you're putting out, you know, delicious, uh, well-crafted food. Uh, what about the costing side of things and the profit 
picture? Do you spend a lot of time just really dialing in the finances because it's so much a, an important part of your overall profitability? Like, tell me about your whole process with, you know, your food costs and just, you know, the, the steps you take in all the other thousands of things you do every day just to make sure that your restaurant is profitable, not just appealing to the public. So uh, going back to the menu development conversation we had before, we start with a, a small group of people, might be three or four of us, uh, usually at least one person representing the front of the house and then uh, three other people from the kitchen. And we're kicking ideas around. Um, those ideas then get uh, tested as specials in the coming days and weeks. Uh, and uh, then we go through a costing uh, process. So in that portion, we're, we're looking at every single item in that dish and we're saying, all right, this piece is going to cost this. And you get a, 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 a finished food cost number. Uh, and sometimes we've tabled ideas because they're simply too expensive mm -hmm. uh, or we've modified dishes. Does that item that's adding a lot of cost, is it adding a lot of value to the dish or can it live without it and still be a really good dish? Uh, so there's some tweaking that goes on there, but we're very careful about um, weighing out each individual ingredient, um, putting a price on it, knowing what our, our cost is per dish. And consistency is really important with the portion controls on every aspect of the menu, right down to the desserts. And, you know, I had staff in the past that would put two scoops of ice cream on a dessert just to please the customer, you know, and you can't have that happening too often. There go the food right. costs, right? And that's just one small example, but consistency and controls and making sure that every dish looks as it should and the, and the plate presentation is perfect and all those things. I'm sure you do all those things. Yes, although, you know, that that's always a challenge, you know, back to the labor conversation. If you're if you've got a new uh, garmage person making a salad every four months, uh, it's hard to be consistent because they all want to make it look a little bit different or or uh, they may make it look a little different uh, uh, just by the nature of it. So, you know, the labor issue starts to play in at that point, too. So you've got obviously a critical eye because you spend time, you spend so much time in, in gather, but you're also touching every aspect of the restaurant in every, you know, in every day that you open to the customer. Um, things like that jump out at you and then you correct someone and you say, it shouldn't look like this, it should look like that. I mean, or the person that they report to, you go to that person and you say, let's, let's make sure that everyone makes sure that everything yes. is consistent and looks the way it should. And, you know, and there's a quality control aspect to it that, you know, there's no gravy dripping off the side of the plate or, you know, that sort of thing. Like every dish needs to go out so that it looks perfect. And I call that wow factor. You know, you, play, you put a plate in front of a customer and they look at it and they don't even want to dig into it right away because it looks so amazing. You know, they might even well, take out their phone and take a picture before they even take a bite. And I, on that point, you know, your, your servers can be uh, a level of quality control that uh, if they're trained right uh, and given the right to speak up. Uh, yes. I've had plenty of servers say, that dish doesn't look right. Are we missing something? And sure, it, you know, uh, in that case, uh, it might be missing an ingredient that the new garmage had forgotten or mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is. So, uh, it, you know, empowering your, your servers to speak up uh, is a good thing. I love that word empowerment. You know, that is definitely a great way to run a business so that people take a vested interest in what they're doing and they truly care about what they're doing. And that's that doesn't mean uh, you give the servers a green light to tell the kitchen what to do. No, no. <laughs> With the reason, good judgment we're yes. talking about here, right? That's on brand and on strategy right, and right. All those things. So we've uh, just touched upon branding and marketing, what do you do to attract new customers in addition to keeping your regulars happy? Well, that's a good question. Boy, that's a challenge every day. Uh, what are we doing every day uh, waking up? Um, what are we going to do to bring new people in? Uh, is, is, a, is a constant day-to-day um, uh, uh, challenge uh, that we we deal with or I deal with uh, uh, so 
uh, we're, we're deploying different things uh, that what I want to avoid is I, I don't want to get into the game of just discounting product all the time. Um, so I don't want to be the, you know, the two for one or the uh, 50% off or whatever it is. I want to give people a reason to come in uh, that's not just about price. Uh, I, I really work hard to avoid that because it's, it's a it's slippery slope. If, if, you, if you all of a sudden get into that game, then your customers are going to expect it. Uh, on a regular basis. And you're also going to attract people that are price driven. Uh, and that's not the kind of place th that put us on the map at all. Uh, now, price is important for people. I don't want to discount that. But so uh, we, you know, we, we work hard to put out a good product every night. Um, but it doesn't mean that there are uh, aren't uh, empty seats during the week that we would love to fill. So uh, we're exploring right now uh, uh, the idea of doing a board game night. So uh, the idea is to help people uh, unplug from technology and plug into each other. And that's how we intend to sort of characterize it. Because I, I think that the world has realized that our phones are evil. Am I right? Uh, we all hate our phones. The blessing and uh, curse. We hate that our kids have phones. Right. And we've lost the connection at dinner time. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna try this idea, see how it goes. We also do a uh, we also do some price driven things. I've got a, a half price wine bottle night on Thursday nights, um, but we call it girls' night out. So we didn't just hang our hat on the half price wine. Really tried to promote something that was already naturally happening. Women would come out, meet up. Uh, and we just formalize that in the form of a girls' night out uh, kind of thing. So, and I, I think the oysters are going to present an opportunity to I bring people that. in during lower times. Uh, when the deck is open, the weather is warmer, uh, we can play around with that as well. So it's getting creative. Uh, we also do special dinners um, where uh, we close for the night and create a ticketed event. It's a multi course meal. Uh, really elevate things, uh, let the kitchen do something different and creative. And uh, that just creates a little bit of buzz for people and uh, interest beyond just being open every single night. That's but right now I'm relying, right now I'm relying on social media almost exclusively to drive people, which I know is problematic. Uh, I've gotten away from print uh, media uh, lately, very expensive, not so convinced that it's driving people. Uh, it, it's a challenge. It's hard to do things and, and measure. Yeah, it's not really, I mean, that's a shotgun approach. It's not trackable. You can spend a tremendous amount of money unless everyone that walks through the door says, you know, hey, Matt, I saw your ad in the Portland Press Herald or whatever it happens to be. You'll never know if it's effective. But social media, at least you have engagement and you're seeing how many people respond to your posts and that sort of thing. Are you taking photographs of some of your signature dishes and, and posting those things? What do you do for social media? What's your strategy? Well, um, I've been doing a lot of that, of course, um, which is not unusual. I think a lot of people are doing that. Uh, and some of those I've had done professionally. I've also uh, developed my own light box so that I can take decent quality pictures. They're not all yellow looking. Yeah. Uh, uh, or we use natural light if, if we have it. Uh, so, yes, there's plenty of photos of, uh, of food uh, being pushed out, although... Um, I find that um, people and faces are actually sometimes more engaging. Uh, so what we're working on right now is uh, trying to profile some of our partners, some of those uh, food makers and food growers that I mentioned earlier, uh, and doing little uh, 30, 45 second uh, snippets, uh, video snippets that tell their story that help us communicate the kinds of things that we're doing. And I'm in the process of doing that right now with um, a, a group in Portland. So we'll, time will tell on that one uh, and we'll see. I think that's a really strong idea. You know, I mean, that, that just makes, makes the restaurant appealing and approachable and, and it brings your story to life. I think that's, that's a great idea. Tell me, Matt, so. 
What are the things that have, over the past seven years, if you could look back, what were your biggest challenges in starting the restaurant in and continuing to operate it daily? Anything stand out that really challenged you and really pushed your limits? And yes, uh, lots of them. Oh, gosh. Um, I think every day we're faced with challenges. And it's funny, I think you have, you have to, you laugh sometimes when, you know, you got three pieces of equipment that all break at the same time and you've got to open at five. But uh, I'd say some of the things that stand out, there was a time probably about three or four years ago where we had some really bad issues with speed of service. So uh, we had good food, um, but we were getting hammered uh, uh, on reviews around how slow our service was. Mm -hmm. And you know, you really have to figure out uh, what's behind that. Is it is is the kitchen the the reason for that? Is it the front of the house? Uh, is it how you have things staffed? Uh, is it your leadership? Um, so it, it was a real nut to crack, and it took a long time to figure it out. But it it involved all of those things, of course. It involved having the right person leading the front of the house. Um, which I didn't at the time, and that was part of it. It involved um, looking at our menu and our pickup times. Uh, did we have a menu that required, you know, a dozen touches just to get a dish out? And were there things we could do to change and alter without compromising quality to get a dish out quicker? And then it had to do with, how, are we staffed right on the floor? Do we have enough people to take care of the customers that are on the floor and uh, we've since put speed of service behind us as an issue and really but it required a lot of focus and a lot of uh, attention to how we're going about getting food out so that was a big challenge what do you find most gratifying about running the restaurant i, I think that's hard to Put a finger on or, or to articulate it I can only describe it when I walk in on a Sunday and brunch is in full swing and the music's playing and the lights shining through and the place is full of customers and they're having a good time and enjoying each other that's why so many of us do this is you create a space for people to come together and enjoy each other and enjoy food and when that's happening on a scale that uh, is sustainable for you, uh, it's really exhilarating and that up, up, uplifts me. Uh, the opposite is true when uh, you walk in and it's slow and it's dark and it's <laughs> things aren't going the way you want and it's, it's, a, real, it's a real downer. <laughs> Luckily that doesn't happen too often. Right, it can be a roller coaster ride. Okay, I can yeah. totally see. That was a good answer to gratifying <laughs> in running a restaurant. <laughs> You, you touched on music. You have live entertainment some nights? We do. Uh, we have live, a live bluegrass band that plays every Sunday brunch. Yes. Uh, and uh, we pay them. We also feed them, uh, which is not a small amount. Uh, but they are a big reason people uh, come back. Uh, or, or they are an ingredient in the mix of brunch that if we were to remove it, I'm not sure we'd have the same product. So w someone from the outside might look in and say, well, um, boy, you could really save some money if you got rid of the band. Uh, and I'm sure I could, but I think it would kill the product. Um, and uh, we used to do more um, on, we do Wednesday night once a month uh, music. We used to do it every night uh, and that, that just got prohibitive to do it every Sunday and every Wednesday and it just wasn't the same experience. So we pared that back down and uh, looking at other ways of driving midweek business like I described earlier. You touched on a real challenge that every operator comes across. It's those critical decisions that you make that either work or they don't work and they turn off the customer and suddenly you lose all the gains that you brought in, in an attempt to save money. You know, that's a real yeah. fine line. And uh, yeah, I mean, I remember back in those days, some of those decisions are make it or break it. And you got to be, you got to listen to your customers and, and maybe that's when you call them and, you know, all the people that come in for brunch, 
with the comment cards in the old school way or just face-to-face -face conversation with the staff that report back to you saying they love the bluegrass band, you know? So we can't get rid of them. Well, there's so little discretionary dollars yes. in the mix. There's just not much. Uh, it, 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 you can't turn off the lights, you know? Uh, you got to cook the food. You got to pay the servers in the, in the back of the house. So in the end, there's not much to be tinkered with. Uh, and that's one that I could cut, but I, I've chosen not to. That's smart. Let's talk about triumphs. Uh, we talked about challenges. We talked about what's gratifying. Can you think of any really big triumphs that you just said, yes, wow, this is amazing. Uh, anything that happened that just really either puts you on the map or just, you know, just stuck out in your head that you'll never forget? Hmm. I think, I don't know if it was one single event. I, I think being able to operate profitably for the first five years of opening a restaurant uh, was not what I expected um, and certainly not what I've heard is the norm. Uh, yeah, right, right. And uh, now in our sixth year, we, we struggled. We're back on track now and I think in a, in a much better place. But for the first five years, we were uh, a profitable, uh, uh, decent running machine. That doesn't mean that there weren't things for us to improve on. There's always things to improve on. But uh, I was I was proud of that. I, I felt like that was um, a triumph of sorts, not a single event necessarily, but we celebrated it uh, yeah. at five year at, at five years. Uh, we had a big party, a big block party uh, where we uh, invited customers uh, free of charge. We cooked a big barbecue. We had an oyster shucker uh, music and it was just a really fun celebration to thank them for coming out and we had, and, uh, we had a great turnout. So I'm sure. Fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I would consider that a business builder, you know, that's some, that's called marketing budget right there. Right. <laughs> Giving back and saying thank you and appreciating the customers that have supported you. And that's definitely a triumph. I mean, we all know the statistics, so many restaurants fail in the first two years and so many more fail in the first five years. And here you are seven years going strong. And yeah, you had a little dip at year six. Uh, does that stand out in any way as to what went awry there and how you got back on track? What, what would you say contributed to that change? Well, I would, I would say I, I wouldn't consider us completely back on track. I think we're pointed in the right direction and, and uh, uh, the trends are, are more improved for sure, but I think there were two things that uh, got us off track. One uh, is the labor issue that we've talked about, uh, and that's why I've, I've been so uh, eager to be involved in what I hope to be part of the solution that you and I are a part of a committee, a workforce committee on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that just uh, sent us spiraling. It was, we were often shorthanded, uh, the turnover was high, uh, and the labor costs were just rising and rising. And at the same time, our covers were starting to dip a little bit. So it was a really uh, bad combination, bad timing. Uh, and uh, in the process of all that, I was trying to find new sources of revenue. Uh, so we added lunch, uh, we added prepared meals to go. Uh, and in hindsight, all they did was complicate things and add costs they really didn't bring in a lot of extra revenue. Uh, so uh, we've gotten back to a much simpler model, uh, really working on uh, taking care of the employees that we have, uh, how are we gonna hold on to them, reward them, all of those things. So I think the model that we have now is back to where we were, keep it simple. Let me ask you, do you ever bring in secret shoppers for the experience? I haven't done that. Uh, I think it's a great idea, uh, and I, I, I should be doing it. <laughs> Would your staff feel on the spot if you sat at a table for dinner on a reasonably busy night and expected them to treat you like any other customer, but just to see and sort of feel the experience that your customers are having from your own perspective? Do you ever do that? Would you think about doing that? Would I go in personally and have a meal and on a busy night, you mean? 
Uh, or would I do it? Super busy, but you know, just a normal night where it's not going to throw anything off. You're not going to take up a table that could be utilized, but just to sit down in different sections, you know, and, and seeing the different experiences that the different service team are providing and critiquing them on it. Yes, I do that all the time. Oh, you do? I, I do that all. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely do. I, I, uh, I probably do that at least four times a month. Um, no question about it. Uh, and back to the secret shopper, I, I yeah. wouldn't label them that, but I, I do, you know, I live in a small town and uh, I know a lot of people, not just because of the restaurant, just know people and they will tell me, um, they will say, you know, listen, I was in your restaurant last night and I had a great experience. Or they might say, wow, I was in your restaurant and things weren't, things these were a shit show. Uh, what happened? What's going on? Over there? So, sure. I mean, I, I don't have official secret shoppers, but I have people that provide feedback to me on a regular basis. But I, I like the secret shopper idea a lot. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, I mean, it just, you, you got to make sure that things are always firing on all cylinders. And in, in, in a human relations business, that's, that's hard to do on a, on a consistent basis. But that's where the training and the consistency come in and, and the philosophy that you share with your staff and how, you know, you really got to put yourself in your customer's shoes and know what they're expecting and you got to over deliver on their expectations. And on a daily basis, that's a challenge. But right. it doesn't mean that we don't keep striving to, to provide those types of experiences. Is there anything else you've talked about that I might have missed um, in this conversation, Matt? Anything else you'd like to tell us about Gather or about your experience running restaurants? Or I have one final question after you answer this one. Uh, uh, it'll give you an opportunity to you know, share your advice with other operators. But is there anything else I, I, you'd like to talk about? I think uh, one of our most interesting programs uh, is this thing we call Garden Barter. I, I think I may have mentioned it to you before. But uh, this is a program where we let uh, – you know, the home gardener uh, come in with their surplus vegetables. So let's say you have got a garden at home and like so many people, you, you plant in the spring and all of a sudden uh, you get this bumper crop of peppers or tomatoes or cucumbers or whatever it is. You've got way too much. Even your friends are like, I don't want any more of that. Uh, we let those people bring those, that surplus in uh, and get uh, credit at the restaurant in the form of a gift card. And we just reloading uh, credit onto that same gift card. It's fairly simple to execute. Uh, but I, I consider it a, a, a way to engage uh, customers on a different level than just, you know, a price relationship or uh, whatever it is. And um, so I, I'm really proud of that program, and I, I love uh, what it does. It's also unique where local media has wanted to report on it and talk about it, uh, which is hard to get media to, to write or talk about you when you're five years old. Sure. You're not new. <laughs> I think unique is the key word. I think that is a very innovative idea. I've never heard of that being done before, but I love the fact that it's working for you, and it's just increasing the relationships that you have with the customer base. I think that's a beautiful, right. and I think others could benefit, other operators could benefit from something similar. Sure. At any time, did you ever consider growing your own garden on the premises in any way, no. shape, herbs, uh, vegetables, any that sort of thing? Uh, we tried early on to grow some, uh, you know, some herbs in a small, area and we quickly realized that the amount that we go through mm. is just silly and compared to what we could grow so it you know you might grow something and you harvest it and uh it might be a day's worth of herbs that you <laughs> that it's you, gone. right yeah and i'm just not a grower either i it's not a skill area of mine and i i, I leave that to the farmers who do it well right and your barter program i love it right <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, what advice would you give to a new restaurant owner operator that's just getting into the business? If you could put yourself seven years back in time, obviously we have the benefit of hindsight and experience now, but what advice would you give 
two, twofold to a new operator and then someone that's in your shoes now, five, seven years on, you know, running against the same challenges that you're having. And what advice would you give both those people? Oh boy. Uh, so seven years ago versus uh, today, uh, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say if I were to put myself back seven years ago, I would, I would say don't try and do it all. Uh, and, and I think I got uh, caught up in that where I was trying to be in too many places and do too many things. And eventually you're going to run out of time and uh, something's going to suffer, whether it's the food or the equipment or the front of the house. And uh, so that involves hiring and, and uh, coaching the right people. So uh, investing in that side of things is, is really key. And then the second part of your question was what again? Okay, so what advice would you give to a current operator who's been in the business for many years that's coming across many of the same challenges that you are? Uh, if you were just going to talk shop with someone in your shoes running a similar operation, what would you say to them? Um, where I've found some success or uh, comfort is finding other people who are in the same shoes you are uh, and not living it alone. Uh, so other operators, um, having coffee with them, even if you're just talking shop, um, it, it, it's really uplifting to know that you're not alone, but you also can get some really good ideas, right. uh, things that you can try on your own. Uh, it, it's easy to dismiss ideas from people who have not been in your shoes and say, oh, that'll never work, or you don't know anything about running a restaurant. But if you're hearing it from somebody who is literally doing it that day, just like you are, just happens to be in a different market or a different town, um, my, my ears perk up, perk up for sure. Uh, so I, I go out of my way to find those people um, and uh, have conversations with them, whatever it looks like. Yeah, and many of the people on our committee for Maine Hospitality are like-minded people in the trenches, running operations every day, just like you are. And there's, there's just something gratifying of being on the same team and going through the same thing and just sharing coffee and just getting to know each other. Yeah. And, you know, there's that camaraderie and that similar passion in running restaurants and putting out great food and pleasing the customer. These are all the elements that, that make for any successful restaurant. Yeah. Matt, it's been wonderful having you as a guest. I'm so happy that you uh, took the time to, to be on our podcast today. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, and we'll see you next time. Guys, thanks for being part of this episode. If you got a lot out of it, just know that this is the first in a series of what I call the Independent Operator Series. I hope to feature lots more real managers and owners of restaurants running their day-to-day -day operations with all the pitfalls and the challenges and the triumphs and successes that go with it. This is a business about passion, and that's what I'm hoping to bring to you with these new guests coming up. And for more real resources that can help you run a stronger operation, check out restaurantrockstars.com. And why not subscribe to the podcast on iTunes? If you like what you're hearing, pass this on because it's a way other owners and managers can find us. And we appreciate you listening as always. And I'll see you in the next episode.